Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After what has seemed like a very long week, New Glenn finally lifted off on its second flight. While the primary goal of the flight was to launch the pair of Escapade spacecraft which would ultimately go to Mars, they were also planning on testing the landing capabilities of the New Glenn booster. This was seen to be quite a long shot, hence the name of the flight being Never Tell Me The Odds, a reference to Empire Strikes Back, where C-3PO points out that the odds of successfully navigating an asteroid field are approximately 3,720 to 1, to which, of course, Han responds, Never Tell Me The Odds. Now, there was no asteroid belt involved, but this was merely the people at Blue Origin setting uh, expectations for what they believed was a risky manoeuvre to attempt to land this booster. Unlike Falcon 9, New Glenn was designed to use propulsive booster recovery from day one. And they had taken their sweet time getting this thing to the launch pad. In fact, it was ten years ago that they began landing the new Shepard suborbital booster. So after a couple of delays, the launch did actually proceed to zero and it began liftoff. Ponderously slow off the pad, but this is apparently normal. Its thrust to weight ratio at launch is comparable to the Saturn V and that worked pretty well. Also, this thing is pretty close to being about the same height as a Saturn V, albeit about half the weight at launch. It's propelled by seven BE-4 engines, each generating about 250 tonnes of thrust burning methane and liquid oxygen using a staged combustion powerhead, which makes them more advanced than the Merlin engines on the Falcon 9, but definitely a step below the Raptor engines that we see on Starship. The Raptor 3 is expected to produce the same thrust as one of these engines, but in a much smaller area. It's got twice the chamber pressure. And looking at the relatively slow initial acceleration of this, I'm hoping that that means that Blue Origin has some room to improve these engines by adding a little bit more thrust. Even a modest increase in thrust, like 1%, would add like 100 kilometers per hour to the final burnout speed. To get an idea of just how slow this is, it is still subsonic 1 minute 20 seconds after launch. For comparison, Falcon 9 cracks through the sound barrier about 50 seconds after launch. That's like full 30 seconds faster. But part of that slowness is because, relatively speaking, New Glenn carries more propellant, so it's able to burn for about 20% longer before it stages. And both upper stages start out with similar velocities and altitudes. One thing I was disappointed about was the initial tracking camera footage was kind of blurry, which is unfortunate. New Glenn is a pretty good looking rocket and this was the first time we saw it launching in daylight. So yeah, it's kind of a shame that we got all these out of focus pictures, but there are plenty of people on the ground that got some fantastic shots of it lifting off with its really cool looking Mach diamonds in the uh, engine exhaust. Anyway, the tracking cameras sorted themselves out, gave us a great view of stage separation. First of all, we have the engines on the main stage shut down. But then we never actually got any video of stage separation because we switched to this internal camera which clearly froze. So uh, they sat at this for a few seconds and then eventually cut back to the outside by which point stage separation had happened. And you can see second stage lighting its engine, a big cloud of uh, vapour. And note the second stage turning its nose upwards suddenly pointing further to the sky, and that is a fascinating manoeuvre. And I have a few thoughts about that, but there's a couple of other things to watch during staging. First of all, did you see that? We got a momentary glimpse into their uh, video system here. So on the left side, you can see the sort of tail end of list of, of uh, cameras. Some of them are like obviously stage one, aft, eng, and then locks, LNG, and then down you're like stage two mid X, etc. Uh, in the camera right on the top right, you can actually see uh, what looks like the camera that sat underneath the launch pad looking up. Anyway, I find that interesting because we didn't actually see a lot of those cameras. Moving onwards again, so we've got the second stage, it's pointed up a little higher angle than normal, and the next thing that happens is stage separation. Again, we don't see that from the onboard cameras, but we do see it from the ground. And what I like here is you can actually see those stage sections wobbling, right? So they're thin enough that they are, they're flexed by the you know, stage separation or the fairing separation system. Uh, we don't see any of the fairings fly by from the second stage camera, unfortunately. And so now from this point on, the ground cameras are tracking the first stage and the second stage we get onboard visibility. So what, what was the reason behind that uh, pitch up maneuver on that second stage? 
The reason you normally do that is when after staging you realize you don't have enough thrust, you don't have enough vertical speed to get to orbital velocity before gravity pulls you back to the ground. So you pitch your spacecraft up and oppose gravity just a little to give you more time. This is something I end up doing in Kerbal Space Program all the time when I make a mistake. We saw it happen on an Atlas V when the first stage on that burned out about five seconds early and the second stage Centaur had to make up the performance, so it's actually spent a lot of time and it barely got to orbit. That was entirely down to the onboard guidance, realizing that it had to make a correction and succeeding. But in this case, I don't think it was actually a problem. I think this was intentional because the booster ends up right on target. The booster had to have somewhat correct altitude and velocity during separation so that it would end up coming down in the right part of the ocean. A 1% error at these speeds would put them off by a couple of miles. A 1% difference in the engine shutdown time corresponds to about 8 miles. And the booster does have some cross-range capability, but it tells me that the booster was pretty much doing the right thing. So why does the second stage then make this maneuver? Well, I think the second stage is running a very light payload, so it has a bit more performance than it would otherwise have. So it can use that to like make up for being at a lower altitude than is ideal. So that in turn allows the booster to take a lower trajectory, which means the entry burn is going to be a little less stressful. This is basically a way of making things easy for the booster because the landing is a big unknown for Blue Origin. So anyway, you'll notice that I was running time a little faster because we wanted to get down to the entry burn. We're going to light three engines to slow the booster and reduce its impact on the atmosphere. If you look very carefully, you can see almost like an arc in front of the booster as it's firing its engines into this hypersonic airstream. It's like a comet. The gas is shooting out of those engines and then interacting with the atmosphere at Mach 7 and that creates this like halo in front. This is basically a bow shock. Now we've seen the Falcon 9 do this hundreds of times, but I don't remember seeing such a well-defined bow shock. And I think that's simply because the BE-4 engines burning methane produce a very optically thin exhaust, whereas the Merlins produce this bright flame that just distracts away from any other stuff. It is extraordinarily cool to see that happen nevertheless. So now compared to the Falcon 9, after the completion of the entry burn, it uh, looks like New Glenn Booster is moving pretty much at the same speed as a Falcon 9, about, you know, Mach 4.5, uh, 100,000 feet. But now New Glenn should have an advantage because it has those big uh, body strakes that provide extra lift, in theory giving it more cross-range capability. So we now watch this amazing tracking shot, and I think this would have come from one of NASA's WB-57s, possibly November 927 November Alpha which was flying in the vicinity at 45,000 feet. That means it starts to look down on the booster as it descends. This is a gorgeous shot of this. And I assume the attitude is more or less consistent with the horizon. So you can see the kind of angle this is taking down through the atmosphere. As it goes transonic, you see some vapor cone effects, and then you see how it pitched down there? That's it getting ready to light its engines. For the initial deceleration, it's firing three of the engines, and unfortunately for us, it's descending towards the clouds and we lose it. But thankfully, they did have cameras on the booster and on the ship. So this is one of the cameras on the booster. It's obviously in the middle position looking down. And the best part of this is you get to see some trekking over the ocean and the landing legs deploy. And then we cut to what must be a drone hovering next to the landing ship. And that puff of steam next to it made me think it had missed. Because it had, in fact, missed intentionally. We got one frame from this 360 camera and then we saw it actually landing on the barge more or less live. Now unfortunately during this process it's generating a giant cloud of smoke that we can't see anything. I think that smoke is from the uh, the paint that was on the deck of the barge because as the smoke clears we do indeed get to see the booster sitting practically in the middle of the deck of Jacqueline. It, well, it came from orbit, it slowed down, it hovered, it translated, and it nailed the landing. And to be sure, they do this. They literally nail it to the deck. Okay, it's not quite nails, but there are pyrotechnic devices in these landing legs that are basically connecting the landing legs to the ship via welds. 
So this appears to be something that Blue Origin patented uh, a few years ago. There's actually a couple of variations on this, but I believe it's the one that has this pin, this uh, stud that gets pushed down and it goes into the deck. Now, you might think, well, aren't they going to have to like cut these legs off the deck? Well, the way it's designed is they can actually unscrew or unbolt these particular things and lift the legs off and then they have to go through and remove these things from the deck and recondition the deck. There is another design that they patented which seems to use flat discs, but I don't think they use this one because we can actually see these big uh, barrels like sticking up from the landing legs. Another thing I hear, by the way, is that these landing legs are too small and short compared to the big ones on the Falcon 9. If you actually do the measurements, this has a wider base than the legs on the Falcon 9 because the Falcon 9 uses four legs, whereas this uses six, and that means they get 21% extra you know, base size. This, of course, is some authentic reactions from the control room. Watching everyone get all excited. Meanwhile, of course, the second stage is still flying onwards to orbit. So before I talk about the second stage, I want to talk about why the booster missed the barge. It was intentional, right? The New Glenn booster is able to hover on a single engine. The Falcon 9 is not able to do that. It can't throttle low enough. So it has no option but to aim straight for the barge and then you would perform the hover slam. New Glenn, they were able to put it like to a spot next to the barge. And then once they were sure that they had the booster under control, they could slowly like traverse it over, translate it over, and then descend onto the barge on a single engine. Now, this whole process took like an extra 20 seconds or so, during which they're probably burning about 500 kilograms of methane per second. So that's like an extra 10 tons of propellant, right? That is a relatively small proportion when you consider that the whole first stage is probably over a thousand tons when it's fully fueled. So again, we see that the landing profile was intentionally chosen to be conservative, to give them the most options. Uh, and they, in the future, they will be able to optimize it. They will be able to move towards something that is closer to a hover slam once they are sure of their design. And they're probably going to need to do that if they're going to reach the actual payload limits that they have uh, you know, claim that they're able to do. The other thing the hover let them do was precisely put it down in the middle of the barge. Here's a before and after image. Obviously, the paint has been blown off, but you can see this you know, kind, of, kind of fading back and forth. That They were pretty much smack bang in the middle of that circle. And speaking of circles, a few minutes later, they did in fact reach orbit successfully, but this is of course their initial parking orbit. They were going to orbit around until they were at the equator before performing their departure burn to push them into interplanetary space, or actually near interplanetary space. This maneuver would boost the spacecraft up into a trajectory which would take them around the Lagrange points and would be designed to come back in several months essentially right in the middle of the next Mars window so that they would then swing by the Earth really close and then the spacecraft could fire their engines and place them onto the actual Mars encounter trajectory. Now this does mean that the spacecraft are needing to use more propellant, they're having to sit in space longer and, and exposed to more radiation, but it does mean they get to test this new technology and Blue Origin were very interested to test their rocket and then finally there was some concern among the team members that uh, maybe the mission might get cancelled if it sit on the ground too long. So both spacecraft would separate at around the 33 minute mark. We didn't get good footage for one of them, but uh, the second one, uh, yeah, it, we kind of got some imagery of it disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. And of course the next person that sees these will hopefully be out at Mars. As of the, today, I know that they got in contact with them from the Deep Space Network and uh, the spacecraft are healthy. Finally, we got introduced to their little autonomous service robot. This thing drives around the deck and it's going to move around to where the umbilical connectors are and connect to the booster so that it can be saved. One of the things they want to do is offload any remaining propellant, any fuel, because they don't want to just vent the fuel into the air. That's not great. I'm not sure if they collect it in tanks or if there's just like a flare stack on the ship that they can use. Once that's done, it's supposed to be safer for humans to approach the barge. 
And we don't actually know if they've done that yet. The last I looked, the barge was still drifting south. So we don't know how much work is involved before they can start bringing it back to port. Now, we did see an image which was clearly taken from a service ship published by Jeff Bezos. And from this, you you know, you can see it sitting in the center of the barge. And on the left, uh, you can see the uh, little uh, robot which is connected to the umbilicals, apparently. And if we pan the image up to the top... You can see the little pusher rods that are used during stage separation. I expect there will be a lot of people taking pictures of this as it gets back to port, and I won't be surprised if they've covered this up. So congratulations to Blue Origin on being, I think, the third American company to successfully land and recover a booster. Obviously, we've had SpaceX and we've had Rocket Lab who have recovered electrons, but they've only reused parts of them without a whole booster. Technically, also the space shuttle boosters got recovered, but when we're talking about propulsive landing, that's, the, you know, that's the new hotness, right? The mission name, Never Tell Me The Odds, suggests that this was down to luck, but I'm going to say no, this was down to awesome engineering by everyone at Blue Origin. You should be proud of yourselves. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.